Thank you, John. We're going to go into today's scripture, which comes from Genesis chapter 1. We're going to the beginning, <laughs> and we're going to read verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to skip down to, verses, uh, to verse 28, and we're going to read through chapter 2, verse 3. So we'll, we'll put the scripture up here on the slides in a moment, but if you want to find the scripture, uh, if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, um, that would be great. We're, we're going to kind of uh, skip around in Genesis um, chapter 1, so it might be good to have a Bible handy. But it, uh, again, we'll, we'll project it up here too, so no worries if you can't do that. Again, it's Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll skip down to verse 28. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Let's skip down to verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day, chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, we are beginning a new sermon series. It's called Firm Foundation. And as you might expect, we're going back to the beginning. Uh, starting from the beginning. So a couple years ago, we sent a, a team uh, down to Mexico to build a house through uh, Homes of Hope. And it was a really cool experience. Uh, but the thing that we were kind of suspect about was that we were supposed to build a house in two days. And we were kind of thinking, how in the world are we going to build this house in two days? You know, we actually had a very small team. Uh, you can see in the picture, that's our team, but that's also our team with the family that was there. So you can just see how small our team was. And pretty much no one on our team had any construction experience. So we're like, how in the world are we gonna get this done in two days? But we did, you can see there's the proof, right? We built a house, you can see it looks like a house, right? As far as I know, it's still standing. I haven't gotten any frantic emails telling me that the house has you know, fallen down or anything like that. So all good. And to be honest, I really think that if we uh, sort of like cut out breaks or worked a little bit longer, because we only worked till about like 4 or 5 p.m., I think we actually could have finished it in one day. How is that possible? So. The truth is that, the, the, well, I mean, we did build it in, in two days, but the most important part of the house is the part that normally you don't see. And that actually was not built in two days. It's impossible. Do you know what the most important part of a house is? You might have guessed it <laughs> based on the title of the sermon. It's the foundation. And the foundation actually was already set for us before we got there. They poured concrete. There's a big concrete slab where we built the house on. And the thing is, the foundation is so important. Um, and and it, it takes actually some time for the foundation to cement, uh, for it to become uh, uh, completely settled. And th that could take uh, anywhere from two weeks to two months. 
But uh, in most houses, um, the foundation only needs to be half settled, 50%, before you can start building on it. And so that could be as soon as a week. You know, but that's a lot longer than the actual two days it took us to build the house, right? But we all know that if you don't have a foundation, you don't have a house, at least you won't have a house for long. <laughs> and, you know, so maybe the question is, how do you know you have a good foundation? That's kind of what we want to know, right? We're using, obviously, uh, the 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 metaphor of a house for our lives. How do you know that your life has a good foundation? So uh, in scripture, uh, Jesus talks about Matthew chapter seven. He talks about two houses, one house that's built on uh, sand. So uh, kind of a, a shaky, shifting foundation. Uh, and then one house that's built on the rock. And we know which foundation is good when trouble comes, right? When a, a heavy storm blows in, which house is going to be standing? And in many ways, brothers and sisters, I think that's what we have right now during this time. So just like in the story of the, house, uh, of the two houses built on different foundations, uh, sometimes we don't know that our foundation is shaky until trouble comes. If you ever built a house of cards, right, that's very shaky, you know, you could like be like perfectly still, no one breathe, no one move, and it'll be fine, at least for a little bit, right? But if, if you even blow on it a little bit, all the houses will fall down, right? And maybe for some of us, our houses, our lives can stand up and seem to be okay when conditions are perfect. There's no trouble. There's no coronavirus, right? Our finances are perfectly in order. We have all the friends we want, right? We're not lonely. You know, we're having success in school or in our careers. But when trouble comes, that's when you really find out what your foundation is made of. And for many of us, we are finding that perhaps our foundation is not as sturdy as we thought it was. When the things that we normally rely upon you know, I'm not saying these are necessarily bad things, right? They're not. But if these things, anything, is our foundation that is not God, then this is sort of the point, right? That in many ways, that foundation can never be as sturdy as God. We see that, right? You know, some of the things that we thought, like, oh, we could always count on this, right? We're always going to have a physical community. It's been taken from us in many senses, right? For some of us, even our livelihoods are being disrupted. The way that we normally learn, the way we normally go about life. And, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm really happy about this. <laughs> I don't think many of us are. But I wonder if some ways, in some ways, maybe there is a blessing in disguise with all the things that we're going through. Maybe in some ways, it's forcing us to reconsider something that you normally wouldn't find out until later in life, when trouble hits, when inevitably, right, that some things start falling apart in your life. You know, for a lot of people, this is the reason why we talk about midlife crises, you know? You, you, you reach a certain point and then you start wondering, is this it? Is this all my life is? It happens sooner for some people than others. Sometimes it happens when someone in your family gets really sick. Sometimes it happens when you get sick. Sometimes it happens when someone betrays you. Or something that you thought was rock solid, you, you, you get disillusioned with it. I think that's happening to a lot of people in this country, right? Where, where we, we, we sort of like to think of ourselves, as most countries do, as you know, being on the right side, being the good guys. You know, America is this place of great freedom, and you know, it's the greatest nation on earth, and then we start looking at the cracks. We start seeing that you know, maybe there's some things that aren't so great about our nation. And, and that's been really hard for some people. Some people are in denial of that, are still fighting that. But a lot of the things that we normally like to plant our feet on, 
that we try to build our life on these foundations, they're being taken from us. So this is as good a time as any, I think, to rebuild those foundations. And so to me, I think of no better place to start in the Bible, the Word of God. You know, this is something that we say we can rely upon, right? That it tells us about God. It tells us the story of God. You know, and, and so I want us to be able to look at the story and to find out how can we build our houses, our lives, on sturdier foundations. And so this is a very foundational text, is it not? In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, this is where we're starting, right? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is what we're told, right? Today's message is called the source because God is the source of all things, So it just makes sense that you should build your life on God because he's the source. He started it all, right? And in many ways, I think what is happening in modern times is we take God out of the equation, right? We're like, okay, well, you know, maybe in some way I'm kind of thankful, I guess. But I think I can take God out of the equation. That's what a lot of us have done. But we got to remember, in the beginning, it was just God. There was no us. There was no 401k. There was no uh, savings account. There was no community. There was no money. There was no school or career or boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife or family. There was only God. That's it. And God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was there, hovering over the face of the waters. And here we see God creating, and he says, let there be light. And I want to say at this point, uh, you you know, you're going to see this repeated throughout Genesis chapter 1. God will just speak things into existence. He says, let there be light, and there was light, right? Let there be dry land, there was dry land. Let there be people, and there was people, right? And this is how God creates. Now, there's many of us that we look at Genesis chapter 1 And for many of us, uh, from sort of a modern perspective, you know, we bring in science and evolution and all these things, and we start wondering, hmm, is this really how it happened? But you'll notice there's very little how in here, right? It just says, God spoke and there was. And and I believe, I mean, brothers and sisters, I believe the Bible is reliable. I, I believe it is true. But I think that for many of us, we get tripped up because we read it in such a way where we take it completely literally. And I think that for many of us, we we get tripped up on that. But Genesis chapter 1, I think, is kind of a creation poem. There there is a a, a rhythm to it. There's beauty in this poetry. And I want to show you this. Well, we're not going to look at the whole thing, but if on your own, I would encourage you to read Genesis chapter 1 this week. And in many ways, brothers and sisters, this is one of the things I want to encourage you as we're going through the Bible is to read the Bible without having to be the boss of the Bible. What do I mean by that? We have to control every narrative. You have to understand every narrative. You have to approve every narrative. I wonder if we can just take the Bible on its own terms. There might be a place for critical reflection. I'm not saying that you should just throw away your brains, but I think in many ways, when we like enter into critic mode and we're reading the Bible like this, and we're just kind of like, I don't know about this. God created light in one day, and then he created this in one day, and then this on another day, and he did it all in six days. You know, I think that in many ways, we have already put ourselves above God. You know what I mean? In the sense that we become the ones who get to determine what is true and what is not. But if we can just take the Bible on its own terms. And by the way, brothers and sisters, I don't think, even if you think the Bible is true, that everything in the Bible is meant to be taken literally. You know how I know this? Because there's poetry in the Bible. They actually think that there might be actually things like fiction in the Bible. You know, stories that have a point, like kind of like parables or fables, right? You know, when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, was there actually a guy named the Good Samaritan? Probably not. You know, he's telling a story, 
you know, and there's truth there, right? But, you know, if there is poetry in the Bible that is not meant to be taken literally, and if the, the, the Genesis chapter 1 is a creation poem, I think it is trying to tell us something about the nature of God and this universe instead of us for to say, oh, that's exactly mechanically how it happened, right? For instance, let, let me just tell you about the, the structure of Genesis, just so you can see. It's a poem, right? Uh, so you got six days, right? So imagine, um, imagine that you have days one, two, and three over here and days four, five, and six, now, a lot of the Bible, um, this is going to be one of my contentions. You're going to understand it from the aspect of kingdom. This is the reason why many of us don't understand a lot of the Bible, because we don't really have kingdoms anymore, right? But in a kingdom, you have, well, the kingdom, right, the environment, and then you have a king, a master, a ruler, right? And so this is the way God creates. This is the way God works. He creates a kingdom on days one, two, and three, and then he creates the kings or the, the ones who are, are supposed to be in charge, right, who fill that area on four, five, and six, right? So uh, to me, I thought this was really cool uh, when, when I first was, was shown this uh, because the way God creates, it, it, it's, it doesn't really make sense uh, from a rational standpoint or, well, you know, in some ways like, I'm not really sure I would have created it this way, but God creates day and night, right? He creates lights, uh, the greater lights and then the lesser lights on the first day. So you got day and night, right, on day one. And then on day four, then you get the great celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars. That doesn't make any sense to us from a, a rational standpoint, because you're like, well, how do you have light without sun and stars? Well, the sun is a star, right? You have no light without the sun, right? But in many ways, what the creation poem is telling us is you've got the domain, and then God fills it. God differentiates. And so then you have the celestial bodies that fill that domain. You see that? Day one, day four, connected. Day two, you get what? God creates an expanse. And so he creates the waters above and then the waters below. What are waters above? You ever hear of clouds, right? They're filled with moisture. And so God creates the sky, and then we have waters below, which we don't find out until day three is called seas or oceans, because then he, he draws back the oceans and he creates dry land, right? So let's rewind for a second. So day two, you got what? Sky, and then you have water, right? What's created on day five, the parallel? Birds and all kinds of living creatures in the oceans. Isn't that cool, right? And then day three, then you have the dry land. And then you get all the vegetation, all the trees, all the grass, all, all of the fruits. All of these things are created because the parallel on day six <laughs> is all of the things that live on the land, right? And so here you see God's symmetry and, and God's order and God's way of filling the earth. The, the who of creation is probably the most important part of, of the, the, this creation poem in Genesis, right? That God is the creator. God is the originator. So just want to show you uh, a little bit of the rhythm of, the, of this poem. And so we're not going to go into all of it, but in verse 6, it picks up right after uh, the part that we read. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, like we said. Let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under heavens be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So God creates, like we said, right? He's creating the environments, the kingdoms. And then God steps back. Every couple uh, uh, verses, we hear this refrain. Again and again, we hear, you know, okay, there's morning and there was night. 
That was the first day, second day, third day. But every once in a while, it'll be kind of interrupted with this statement. And God saw that it was good. God kept looking on his creation and saying, that's good, that's good. But he kept going, right? There's very little break. And then, uh, yeah, so we, we see God filling uh, the, the, the heavens and filling the seas, right? With all of these, these birds and all of these things. And brothers and sisters, I, I think that there are many ways, you know, if we want to understand the source of all goodness, one of the reasons why I think uh, for a lot of us, we, we've kind of taken God out of the, of the equation is because we don't see a lot of the things that God created anymore. Most of us spend almost all of our time indoors, you know? The very few moments that we're outside, we're not usually paying attention. I mean, I'm the same way. Um, in the past few years, if you've been a part of LGM, you know that I, I try to go out in nature just about every day. It's something that, that I've learned for my own mental and spiritual health. It's not something I grew up with. I was the guy, uh, actually, my parents uh, would take us on, uh, on camping trips um, for a while every summer until me and my brother complained so much, they're like, okay, this isn't worth it. Because I would complain all the time. I look back on it now with fondness, but not back then. Man, I was such a jerk about it. I just complained. Like, I, I would say things like, Mom and Dad, you guys are so cheap. You don't want to afford the, it, right? Like, like, you don't want to pay for the hotel. That's where we're staying in a tent. I don't know if that was partially true, but that was kind of mean, right? But I look back on it now, and I appreciate it. Um, but the point is, I wasn't really kind of like a nature person. Now I kind of crave it. You know, the more that I spend time in it, and the more that I notice uh, some of the cool things in creation, I, I want to show you my favorite bird. So as we're talking about the birds that fill the sky, right? Um, this is my favorite bird. Uh, this is um, uh, the great blue heron. And it is a very common bird in Michigan. Um, actually, when I first started going to the parks, the first time I saw one of these birds, it was so beautiful, right? It's, it's, it's like very, very, it's got this long, slender, graceful neck. And when, when the great blue heron um, flies, um, it, it's, it's really cool. It spreads out its wings, it tucks in its neck, and its feet stick out. So it kind of looks like a pterodactyl. The first time I saw a great blue heron flying by, I was like, what in the world is that? It was so cool looking. And, you know, I thought these things were rather rare, you know? And so I would, like, take lots of pictures, and I would just, like, watch it, right? Comes, I come to find out that they're quite common. Actually, this picture was taken in a pond that's right behind my house. I used to go to a park and, like, look for the great blue herons, and it turns out that they were just in my backyard. I just wasn't paying attention, you know? Um, I, I, I wonder, though, sometimes, you know, that we think about some nature as being really, like, like cool, you know, it's like, oh man, I gotta go to like Yosemite, or I gotta go to Banff, or I gotta go to some like, you know, like the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas to see some really beautiful creation. I gotta go to the ocean, you know. But brothers and sisters, it's all around us, you know. And, and one of the things about um, nature, I think, that, that for me, um, I don't know, I've kind of reflected on this lately, is I, I kind of discount it unless it's rare, you know. Um, like, like the birds, you know, there, there's like all kinds of, you'll see Canadian geese everywhere. Man, if you go to any park or any body of water, you, you almost can't avoid uh, running into a Canadian goose or at least stepping in its poop. You know, they're just everywhere. And I hate Canadian geese. They're, I call them the gangsters of the bird world. You know, like, like I, I've seriously been walking around the park and some Canadian gangsters are like, yo, what, what you, and they, they like charge me, you know, okay, they don't say yo, that's in my head, but, you know, I'm like, dude, don't tangle with these birds, or, you know, you see ducks everywhere, even swans are pretty plentiful, and I just would kind of like pass by them, I'm like, eh, you're common, you know, and, but I'm like, oh, the great blue heron, that's rare, turns out it was just in my backyard all along, you know, maybe there's more beauty around us than we think, you know, and it's just one of these things that we have to pay attention there are these reminders of the goodness, the creativity, the beauty of God all around us. So anyways, this, this is a little bit of an aside, but, I, you know, I'm not an avid bird watcher by any <laughs> means, but I'm trying to learn to appreciate uh, creation more. 
Um, but one of the, the really cool things that God created was us, right? On the sixth day, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock. That word dominion is a, a, a kingdom word, right? And over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And I know we, we get really used to ourselves as well, just like we get used to the birds that we normally see, the trees we normally see. This is the way that our minds usually work. We discount things that we take for granted, that just become old hat, right? This is the way your mind works. So many of us don't think about the wonder that is humanity. I, I've been reading recently uh, this book. I, I'm listening to it on audiobook right now, and it's so fascinating. I had heard about this book, but I was just like, ah, you know, how interesting could this be? But I got it through the public library, so I'm like, it's free. I'll just start listening to it. But man, I cannot stop listening to this book. It's so fascinating. It's called The Body, A Guide for Occupants by Bill Bryson. And... You know, uh, some of the things, man, that you learn about the body, it is amazing. Things that we take for granted. I want to read for you. This is actually um, some things that were compiled by the Washington Post in their review of this book, The Body, A Guide for Occupants. But just want to point out some of these things that I thought were really cool. So we're told about the brain that it holds 200 exabytes of information. You guys know like kilobytes, gigabytes? I don't even know what an exabyte is, but it sounds like a lot. 200 exabytes of information, roughly equal to the entire digital content of today's, today's world, is in your brain. Isn't that mind-blowing, right? The heart beating some 3.5 billion times in a lifetime. The bones are stronger than reinforced concrete, yet light enough to allow us to sprint. The lungs process 4,000 4, gallons of, of air a day. Um, <laughs> Bill Bryson writes, you are pretty seriously perforated. Two to five million hair follicles and perhaps twice that number of sweat glands. Man, we have a lot of sweat glands, like 10 million sweat glands. Um, you are exquisitely fine-tuned with nerve receptors able to detect movement of 0. 0.00001 millimeters. You grow 25 feet of hair in a lifetime. You host 40,000 species of microbes. And when you kiss, you transfer some 1 billion bacteria to your beloved. <laughs> oh my gosh, we are so fascinating, right? No wonder the psalmist says, you are wonderfully and fearfully made. And Bill Bryson, by the way, um, thinks that all of this was done by natural selection. You know, he keeps using the word design. You're designed, you're designed, you're designed. But he says, you're designed by natural selection. Now, again, brothers and sisters, I don't know. I don't know if we were to see how God created that it would look like natural selection. But I, I remember uh, one of my uh, teachers once said, that if the universe is a crapshoot, they were kind of taking a, a variation on what um, Einstein once said, that the universe, uh, that God doesn't play dice with the universe. But if the universe is a crapshoot, it's just randomly rolling dice, it's reasonable to assume that the dice are loaded. Someone is rigging those dice to come out a certain way, right? Because when you see just how exquisitely designed this universe is, it's hard to think that there could be anything other than some sort of creator, not just a creator, not just an engineer or a designer, but an artist. And so we see this, that God creates all of these things, and then he tells us to fill the earth. He tells us to take care of the earth, right? Right? And then we're told at, in verse 31, right there at the bottom, it says, oh, by the way, and, and he gives us every tree with seed and its fruit. 
you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And so God doesn't just create all of us. He provides for us. He gives us food. He gives us fruit. He gives us uh, all of this food and all of these things for us to live. He gives us the oxygen. But there is a source to all of it, and the source is God, right? And God then looked on it again, so we see this phrase. And he saw all that he had made, but we're told this time, he doesn't just say it was good. He says, it was very good. He looks at all of it. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. It's so good that God takes an extra day. I mean, brothers and sisters, he created in the creation poem everything. All, 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 well, at least all of, of the, the, the living things that crawl on the earth, and humans included. You know, at least in the poem, in one day. You know, a, a, it, there's, the psalmist says at one point, to you, O Lord, a day is like a thousand years. You know, so was it one 24-hour period of day? I don't know. To me, that's not so important. But what do I do learn from this? Is if God took, you know, whatever this period of time was to create all of the things that live on the earth, right? That's a lot of work in one day. He takes an equal part in admiring that. The next day, we're told, um, and, and by the way, yes, uh, going back to that idea, he is the source. Um, as it says in Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. We are his children, right? And then God takes a moment to rest uh, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So he admires it. He rests in it. We're going to go back to this in a moment. But brothers and sisters, remember, God is our source. In him, we live and move and have our being. We do not have life without God. That's not just an academic observation to say, you know, the life that you have from the beginning came from God. You know, the trees came from God. The, the, the vegetables came from God. The food came from God. So in some way... You know, in some equation, it's all because of God. But we continually need God, right? In him we live, we move, we have our being. And so, brothers and sisters, it seems to me that what Paul is saying here is that if we don't recognize the source, if we are not connected to the source of all life, we're going to be missing something. Uh, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 2, um, there's this thing that God says to his people. And he says he's appalled. He's shocked. That, that, that he, he, he's, he's just really surprised by something. Dismayed. And, and this is what it is. So uh, verses uh, 12 through 13. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. What are the evils? They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. What is that? The source of all life. And hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What is a cistern? It's something that you fill up with lots of water, right, as your source of water. So if you can't go to a stream, right, or if there's not a lot of rain, right, if you have no, uh, uh, no ready source of water that's continually being replenished, you would fill up one of these cisterns, right? But what God is saying is that what we have made for ourselves, we have made a way for us to not have to rely on God. Ah. God, you know, thank you for the life you, you first gave us, but we got this now. We don't need you anymore, right? 
We're going to build our own lives, our own civilization, our own careers, right? We're going to have this thing called money, right? And that's going to be pretty cool. We're going to have all this stuff, all this technology, and we will have life. But as it says in Jeremiah, what God says is that, yo, those cisterns that you're building, they're broken. There's cracks in them. They're leaky. They don't hold water. It's, it's almost another way of saying that when the winds come, right, when the trouble comes, you will find what your foundation is made from. And for many of us, brothers and sisters, we have not learned to go to the source. Why does God rest on the seventh day? In some ways, yes, he's taking in the beauty of creation. But then he tells us to do something. We are told, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So he set it apart, not just for himself, but for us. We are told to do the same. By the way, this isn't meant to be something that we're legalistic about. You know, technically, the seventh day is not Sunday. I know a lot of us, we call it the Sabbath. It is symbolically. But the Sabbath, Shabbat, Uh, as it's pronounced in Hebrew, actually means Saturday. (laughs) There's no denying it. It's Saturday. It is not Sunday. And by the way, um, the the calendar would have worked, uh, the the days would have worked a little bit different. It began at sundown. That's why for some Jews, they will go to the synagogue on uh, Friday evening, because that's the start of Shabbat for them. Um, But brothers and sisters, it's not about being legalistic about it. But it's this idea that we should rest. What what do we do? Well, maybe we can do what God did. Admire the creation. Take it in. You know? It's not meant to be something punitive, you know, like like, oh, you know, like like stop working and and we're like, ah, we we for some of us we see that as torture. But why? Why is it so hard for us to stop? Why is it so hard for us to rest? You know why, brothers and sisters? Because being God is really hard work. Now, God did it, like, in style and with ease, right? Let there be light, boom, right? Let there be heavens, boom. Let there be plants, boom, right? I mean, he nails it six days, and then he rests. And he's like, okay, we're good. The reason why we rest on the seventh day is a reminder. We ain't God. We're not. Many of us, we are trying to build cisterns for ourselves. We're trying to find a way for us to live without God. We don't need to rely on God anymore when we have money, when we have our careers. But the thing is, for many of us, there is this insecurity we have. We know, I I mean, you know, there's these statistics that most people in America, and I'm sure it's even worse now, that most people in in America are just one or two paychecks away from bankruptcy. If one or two paychecks fall through, that a lot of their economic stability is going to fall through. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of instability. And we see that, man. There's a lot of people that all the things that we thought were so sturdy, they're just crumbling beneath us. And if you think you're God, and if you think you have to be God, oh my gosh, how do you ever stop moving? I got to hustle. I got to work. I got to study. I I know so many people who say, you know, I don't have time for God. I don't have time to pray, right? I have time to worry. I, I have time to... Also, uh, to, you know, play video games and watch YouTube, right? Because I need that. Because being God is so tiring. It is tiring, isn't it? But what the Bible tells us is that you've got a leaky sister. Your foundation is not solid. It will never work. But what if, in faith, you decided, okay, God, If I am not God, and I am not the source, but you are, then I can stop moving 
and hustling and working and saving and planning and worrying, I can halt all of that for 24 hours. Or every once in a while, someone told me that the, you know, just based on God's arithmetic, the ratio of work to rest is about six to one, right? Six days working, one day resting, right? What is it for you? Is it that? Or do you feel like, man, I can't stop? And by the way, even when I'm like relaxing, it's not that relaxing. I'm still worried. I'm still kind of worrying in the back of my mind, or I'm procrastinating. And so the worry is still there. It's still in the background. And this is the reason why, brothers and sisters, many of us, after we get done procrastinating or, or just goofing off or whatever, you don't feel rested because you were still worrying. You were still trying to carry all of that weight. But the Sabbath is different in the sense that you lay it down and you are declaring in faith, I don't have to be God right now. God, you can run this world perfectly on your own. I share this sometimes about um, some of the few, the, the first times that I would go to visit a park. And most parks are like this. You know, they're, they're not like completely secluded, but they'll be by like, you know, a, a busy road or something like that. Most of the parks I go to, you can hear the traffic whizzing by. And it used to bother me because I'm like, I'm trying to be in nature, you know? I'm trying to like get away from it all. And I just hear like people like speeding around and every once in a while I hear someone like honk their horn. They're really angry. They're in a hurry. Get out of my way, you know? And you'll hear that and it would kind of like harsh my peace a little bit, you know? But I actually weirdly started to kind of like it, like hearing the traffic. Because it, it, after a while it became kind of a reminder. You know what? The world's still running perfectly fine without me. Because when I would sit still, there was something in my mind that would, like, protest. When I would sit down and try to rest, you know, in the midst of my worry. Because what your mind is telling you is, Steve, hey, you can't stop, right? Because in some ways, you got to be God. you got to control this, right? you got to go do something. you got to be effective, right? you got to go make money. Right? Or, or even like the worrying. It's our mind's way of trying to wrap itself and trying to control things that haven't even happened, things that aren't even real. Right? And it's completely unproductive. But it's just a sign of a mind that is like the same kind of lives that produce broken cisterns. It, it, it can't produce life in the long run. It's broken fundamentally. And so our, our minds were around and they try to figure everything out. And they try to create life. But what if, what if, brothers and sisters, if you were able to slow down a little bit, quiet down, what if you could sense and know that not only is God real, but he is the source. He is a creator God, and he's continually creating. He's continually bringing out life. I think this is why um, there's wisdom in Sabbath. There's wisdom in rest. This is why almost anyone of any spiritual weight, right, they will remove themselves from the flow of everyday life for a period of time, usually once a day, right? Sometimes we call it a quiet time or a devotional time, just a time of prayer, a time of contemplation, whatever it is, right? And, and what most people find um, is, is kind of like in the words of Martin Luther, where I'm going to paraphrase, but there was a day where he's like, dude, I got so much to do. Martin Luther definitely didn't say dude. This is my interpretation. He's like, dude, I got so much to do. I am so stressed, I am so busy that I got to spend at least three hours in prayer today. It is the opposite of what we normally think. We think, I'm too busy to pray. Martin Luther said, I'm too busy not to pray because I got so much going on, I have to connect to the source. I got to plug in to that electricity. I need to get that 
that refreshing rain. I need that life-giving water flowing through me. And it's one of the things that we learn. Brothers and sisters, many of us, we're running on empty. You know, you, you can get by in life for a certain amount of time with a leaky cistern. And most of us do. But after a while, do you ever find out that you're just, you're just bone dry? There's no more energy coming. There's no more life coming. And you're sitting there and you're just worrying and you're worrying and you're burning yourself at both ends. Maybe, brothers and sisters, what we need to do is completely counterintuitive to your mind. Your mind is designed to hustle, to work, to keep running or running away. By the way, that's what we do when we're on YouTube and when we're doing these things. Again, I'm not saying those things are wrong. If you ever heard me talk about these kinds of things, I'm not saying that playing games is wrong or watching Netflix is wrong. But brothers and sisters, I'm just saying that it is not in and of itself going to give you life. There's only one thing that will give you life, and that is the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, brought about all the life here with the word of God. By a single word, God brings life. And by the way, the the full embodiment of that word is Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, it mirrors in the beginning was, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, right? God created all there was in Genesis. But in John, it says, in the beginning was the word spoken, given, Christ is the word of God. We must receive him daily. I mean, we'll talk more about how we do this. Maybe in your small groups, you can talk about how you could do this. This is a little shameless plug to join a small group. Because brothers and sisters, I think it's another myth. We'll get more into this as we go, but I think that along the same lines of I can live this life without God is I can live this life solo, on my own, right? I'm a lone wolf, right? It's very American, this idea like, you know, I got this. I'm like Rambo for my life. I don't need anybody. But brothers and sisters, I think one of the things, one of the lessons, the the, the lesson from the very beginning is we are created, we are dependent. We are dependent on all the things that come from God, and we're even dependent on each other. And living in community is a dependent life. Living in connection, you cannot do this on your own. And your ego, your mind, that in many ways, I mean, let's be honest, most of us, our minds are a little cracked like those cisterns, right? That we need, brothers and sisters, we need the source of all life. We need that healing. And and we need to do that counterintuitive thing. You may not feel like doing it. It will hurt your pride and your ego. Because your pride and ego, it's just self-defending. That's what it's most concerned about. It's defending itself. It's not really concerned about your well-being. It's not really concerned about life. In many ways, your mind will kind of deceive you. Hey, if you sit still, like seriously, your mind will tell you crazy things. You know, like like when I would try to sit still to pray, you know, and spend like 30 minutes just in silence or, you know, reading the word of God or just being still and just chilling, you know, my mind would be like, Steve, what are you doing? What are you doing? You got to move. You got to do something. What are you doing? You know, and it was almost like, like this threat to it. Like, you can't do this to me. You know, we got to keep moving. Come on, come on. This this is dangerous. And it's so silly. It couldn't be farther from the truth. Only danger is to your ego. (laughs) The only danger is to learning that that idea that you got to do this on your own is a lie. And that does have to die. And that is, by the way, kind of painful sometimes. But in the end, you get life and peace. In the end, you will know where real life comes from. And so, brothers and sisters, it's just very simple. I I just want to encourage you during this time uh, to rest and be still. But 
I actually want to take this a little further. I didn't put this. I just wrote rest and be still because I wanted it to be very simple. But brothers and sisters, I, I read something this, this past week that I thought was very insightful. Because for many of us, silence is actually very punishing. Silence is painful. But someone had this insight that I thought was very profound. You know when silence is painful? When you're focused on yourself in silence. Then it's painful, <laughs> right? You're thinking about all your worries. You're thinking about all your faults. And you're just replaying them in your mind over and over. Who would want to do that? That's painful. But you know when silence is life-giving? You know when silence is restful? You know when silence gives you peace and joy even? It's when you're focused on God. When you're focused on the source. So it's not just rest and be still just because, right? It's not rest and be still like in some kind of Buddhist sense, you know? But you are welcoming the presence of God. And, and if you don't know how to do that, just simply say, God, I just want to be here with you. I, you could repeat that. God, I just want to be here with you. Or you could just say, Jesus. It's one of the ways that, that um, some of the uh, uh, monastics would teach contemplative prayer. They would say, you know, just be with God. Just, we make it too difficult. You don't have to use a lot of words. Just chill. Chill in his presence. They wouldn't say chill. That's my interpretation. And then when your mind starts to wander, and it will wander, that's what minds do. So don't beat yourself up, but just say Jesus. <laughs> just say Jesus, and just be with him. It, it, it's that simple and that hard, but it's life-giving, brothers and sisters. If you learn to do that regularly, it's life-giving. I, I want to take a moment. We're going to go into our time of communion, and in many ways, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to commune. We're trying to become one together with Christ, with God, with the source. And in many ways, brothers and sisters, the heavy lifting of this work of communion was done by Christ through the power of God. So this is the time if you want to grab bread, you want to grab some juice. Um, so... Just so you know, LGM is a, uh, Living Grace Ministry is a United Methodist Church. Um, and in the United Methodist Church, we practice what's called open communion. And what it means is that anyone can come to the table. And the reason why, um, I, I know not every church practices this, but we believe that what earns you the right to come to the table is what Christ did. It's not your goodness. You don't have to clean up your life and then you come to the table. You can come exactly as you are. Because Christ already earned it for you. He already paid the cost, right? He already paid the cost for you to become one. And so, brothers and sisters, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and he would go to the cross, he shared one final meal with his disciples that he called friends even though some would betray him. Almost all of them would fall away and lose faith. But Jesus still shared his life with them and desired for them to be one with him. And so on that day, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. And I want to just take a moment to pray that this bread and this cup will become to us symbolically uh, uh, as a, a kind of metaphor, as a reminder, a physical reminder of all that Jesus was trying to do, of his body and his blood. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this gift of bread and cup, for your body broken for us, for your blood shed for us, that we could be made one with you by this beautiful, but also, God, in many ways, horrific sacrifice, that you would love us so, that you would go through so much pain and suffering for us to be united with you, and your blood that is poured out to forgive us of all our sin. 
when we mess up, when we forget that you are the source, when we keep running to broken cisterns, that we can always come back and we can always rebuild our foundation in you. God, may we take this bread and as we eat it and as we take the juice and as we drink it and as we feel the sweetness of the sugars hitting us, God, and filling us, God, that we are reminded again of your goodness. We're reminded again that you are the source of all life. We thank you, God, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.